Hi, everyone. Welcome to Wandering DMs. I'm Paul. And I'm Dan. And on today's episode of Wandering DMs, we're going to be continuing our celebration of the release of original D&D &D 50 years ago and also celebrate the recent snowstorms that we've had across the U.S. We have snow on the ground here in New York, uh, which isn't always the case. And we're going to be digging into one of the secret nuggets of the original D&D &D box set, the Encounter Table for Ice Age campaign settings that not everybody realizes is in there, is there, in there including like mammoths and cave bears and saber-toothed tigers and more. All that and more today on Wandering DMs. Before we get into it, as always, I'll remind everyone that after the show is our after-party chat, which you can join in. It's a live video chat that happens at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Dan and I get on the video chat with uh, all of our patrons over on our private Discord, and uh, we chat for an hour and continue the conversation. And you can join in on that by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash wanderingdms. Join at any tier, you'll get an invite to our Discord, get that all ironed out by 2 p.m., and we'll see you in the after chat. <laughs> we would love to see you there, as a matter of fact. So, Paul, it has been uh, cold here uh, this uh, this past week and yeah. this past weekend, so I've been, yeah. uh, been bundled up here at uh, is, Wandering is... DMs HQ New York. This is timely for me um, because... Um, my uh, my my apartment building actually has a broken gutter over the back stairs, and it just dumps water onto the onto the steps that lead up <laughs> into the building, and and it's been so, it's a solid sheet of ice out there right now, solid sheet of ice, and I have to be super careful walking down those steps. I've already slid down them once. Oh no! Oh dear! Yeah, yeah it's okay. Yeah. So we'll just put that on our on our encounter tables uh, for upcoming mm. upcoming adventures in our ice age campaign settings. Yeah, I know, so, I know we're talking about Ice Age me, monsters, but I guess we haven't really, you know, now we're going to force us all the way off into a crazy tangent. Like, let's talk about, like, <laughs> environmental hazards. Like, what about ice? Have you ever run an encounter where the ground is slippery? How does that affect combat? Well, that you know, that actually, it's interesting because I, okay, now we're talking. Great. Here's the improvised it's part of the show. Great topic happening right now. <laughs> Wonderful. You know, frequently, because we've had a, one or two episodes in the past about weather systems, right? And that totally does dovetail with this with this topic and how best to do that in D&D. &D. And my my instinct and the thing that I, that, I, that I grapple with is that it's got to be like mechanically interesting in the D&D &D game. And sometimes weather issues... Um, are, are 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 challenging to find find the right space for it. But honestly, like slippery stuff is really very obvious when it happens, and it ties yeah. pretty well into like standard D and D mechanics of like you know you're either down, you're prone, or you're up, or you can move around. And so probably I would say that like even in the last week, like two classic adventures that I was looking at possibly running in the near future had like, oh, if they run across this, you're gonna make a dexterity check, or you slip down, you fall, you fall on your face, or something like that. Um, and that actually is a pretty good, clear, easily visualizable, uh, interesting um, uh, I think like, terrain like mechanic. Off the cuff, if I was if I was running an encounter that was set someplace very icy, I would probably want to do something where like you have to move at half movement speed, or you have the option to move at full movement speed, but then you got to make a save or you slide and fall on your butt. But then, I think you know that's what exactly. I really want, I think though, yeah. What I really want, though, is then some extra die roll that says, and then you move maybe a little further than you wanted to go, or maybe you go some, right? Like, a little uncontrolled mm -hmm. movement in a, in a wrong direction would be wonderful. Especially if there's, like, you know, I was and such. <laughs> I, well, that's exactly it. I have a specific scenario that I've run a couple times <laughs> as a tabletop miniature event that has exactly that. You're on a glacier. It's got some chasms and that exactly that happens and i've had at least one person slide slide into the abyss uh in exactly that way to their doom and i've also had someone i'll just say someone flying overhead right and then they were like well i'm going to position my flying wizard over the the chasm because nothing can get me there i'm safe dispel magic And that was the end oh, of that cool. character. Oh, 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 no. <laughs> and just, you're out of sight, you're gone. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. That's funny. <laughs> now, Josh okay. in the chat is reminding us, I, I can't help but point it, Josh is helpfully reminding us about the, the Ice Bees dungeon design dash that we, oh, that we yeah. did in a prior season, right? 
Yeah. You know, I, I was mentioning on the on the Discord server recently that um, I'm going to a few conventions in the near future, and I've decided to start running the design dashes as as games at the event at the uh, conventions. Um, so Ice Bees is not. I'm going to start with the first one. I'm doing WDM's one first, but I, what it was Ice Bees number two. I think I believe so. Yes. Yeah. So all right. Yeah, I'm excited to do Ice Bees. There sounds sounds like fun. Did we, I, I'm sure we didn't think to put any kind of clever ice traps in there, but maybe I'm wrong. I got, I got to go read it. What, what did we make? <laughs> oh, now, for the younger viewers, if you're confused by us referring to particular adventures by numeric codes, watch last week's episode. <laughs> where we praise that. Uh, and we, we, yeah. we eat our own dog food. Yep. Yep. Um, all right, I'm, I'm, pull, I'm pulling the second one open here just so I can look at it and remind myself of whether or not we actually, uh, we actually put any uh, hazards. But that's not what we're here to talk about, Dan. Isn't, aren't we supposed to be talking about Ice Age monsters? Now we are. Monsters specific to the Ice Age, such as um, these? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> <laughs> yes and yeah yeah <laughs> oh oh we so you know what we did here i'm I'm, re I'm reading it now and it's and what we did is yeah. actually the the walls and ceiling all contain bits of frozen waxy honeycomb and any fire spells have a chance of melting the wax causing the entire room to collapse so frozen honeycomb is what we did not not ice necessarily but good stuff See, I'll point out that, um, and and this this happens in a couple like ice base adventures is like, just pick, just modify one single spell that your player characters have, namely fireball, right? Just modify <laughs> fireball uh, yeah. if they're at that level. And fireball, like, it, it does it make a it makes mist or fog or make it more slippery for a brief time or collapse the ceiling, right? That changes a whole system that your characters are probably going to interact with encounters of just put a twist right. on fireball and some kind of icy thing or a, a villain that has ice powers goes right in the right slot for that i i seem to remember you doing that when you ran g2 isn't that correct there's a character that had a wand of fireballs and something weird was happening like it was making steam or something like that right yes that's what yeah. happens in the uh, Glacial Rift of the Frost Giant Jarl, uh, the, the yeah. second ever adventure published by, uh, by the makers of D&D. &D. Is that an adventure? Um, and that's exactly that? what's in the book there. Yeah, oh, yeah interesting. That's totally, that's exactly in the book. And it has exactly what your, instinct, your instincts were to begin with, Paul, of it briefly makes the ground slippery. You can slip off one of the cliffs uh, to your doom. It makes a big fog cloud. There's a particular, there's a couple places where the room might possibly collapse. And on the one hand, right, it's exactly what you want against the frost giants because frost giants are obviously immune to cold uh, effects. Uh, in classic yeah. D&D, they, they simply take normal damage from fire. I think in some later editions that they could take more. So you go in thinking, great, I'm going to bring a whole bunch of fire spells against my icy based opponents. But then the terrain around you is working against that in a whole lot of ways. And you might have to, the players might have to adjust on the fly. So it's kind of a really interesting uh, give and take where they're trying to find the middle ground of that. Hmm. Hmm. All right, let me see if I can get us back on topic. Does G2 include any classic Ice Age monsters or is it just giants? Uh, I think it does. It you know it's mostly a lot of fantasy stuff. There's uh, you know spoiler. Uh, there's frost giants. There's yetis. There are there there are some white dragons. Um, uh, there's some hyenodons at some point, which would count as a real world creature. I believe dire wolves, right? Spotted wolves, dire wolves. Um, yep. were actually real things. And it's interesting because you know we and this will be a theme I think for the episode on my part is. Uh, dire wolves. You think um, Tolkien, you think goblins, and some people might not be aware that they were real. Um, uh, particularly in the third edition, there was a whole lot of, um, you know, everything became a dire whatever, but that was all inspired by dire wolves, which were actually a thing in the world. Hmm. Hmm. But, but only wolves. There were no dire... Badgers, dire eels, 
Dyer. I think those are game, I believe, someone could correct me, but I believe that those are game iterations. I think that Dire Wolves are real, and I think... Some some game some the word game designer said, "Oh, keyword dire. I can extract that and apply it." <laughs> <laughs> this this right here, this right here. So okay, so I was thinking about this, and the thing that I uh, the, the thing that my my first thought went to is when I was a kid, right? Uh, I was super into dinosaurs. I was super into dinosaurs. These you know prehistoric you know giant animals just seemed like the most interesting thing ever, and so I was you know asking for more dinosaurs dinosaur models and I had dinosaur books and uh, I believe one of my relatives great great I'm gonna get Dan more of this kind of stuff and so I got a, a kids illustrate book um, by uh, Tom McGowan uh, and Rod Ruth uh, called album of prehistoric animals and I'm like great more dinosaurs and I opened this up and I was like there are no dinosaurs in here what the hell is this <laughs> what the hell are these things there's these these crazy these crazy looking animals that I have you know never heard of like the Alta Camelus like a cam like a camel giraffe cross or um, the platybelodons look at that right and so um, so I I had no idea what any of this kind of stuff was wonderful art in here by the way yeah, um, yeah and you would think that these are made up. Right, you could easily believe that these are fiction. <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. And I feel that you could pull a lot of you could, and I I find in my gaming that I get a surprising amount of traction by finding something that's historically real but not well known. Right, mm -hmm. not off the beaten path. And if you dig into like a crazy niche area of history or archaeology or engineering or biology. You're going to find some crazy stuff that nobody else, you know, most people don't know about. And if you trot that out in your game table, you're going to have this interesting twist of it's kind of uncanny. Like I'm intentionally pulling something in the uncanny valley of it kind of sort of makes sense, but I've never heard about it. It seems sort of fictional. And I get a really good reaction out of my players who frequently think that I made it up. Nice. Nice. So and I think whereas dinosaurs, uh, sorry, Paul, I think that, you know, everybody knows about dinosaurs, uh, Tyrannosaurus rex and so forth. But if you pick animals from the Pleistocene era, the, the, the last ice age or so forth, uh, you're going to get some really interesting creatures that people possibly don't know as well. Hmm. So do, are any of these monsters statted up? Do we, can we find them in our monster manuals? Well, let me take a look at, Again, 50th anniversary, I think this month. Let me take a look at uh, original D&D. &D. Um, and so I think I have the first picture with a red dot there, Paul. So you, you pull up the, um, the, bo the original box set, 1974, and you pull up the, the DMs booklet in that box set, and you have a bunch of outdoor encounter tables. And like somebody said in the chat earlier, you know, you have plains and you have mountains and you have forests and you have a bunch of stuff. And then right at the end, you know, very curtly, so brief that you could miss it, you have a couple of optional tables that are marked optional swamps. And if you, if it's, if you look closely at it, it's a whole bunch of dinosaurs. And it's optional arid plains. And if you look really, really closely, as we've discussed before, that's all the Barsoom stuff from Mars from uh, the John Carter books. And the very last one here, it says optional mountains. And what it is, is it's a whole bunch of uh, creatures from the Ice Age, from the late Pleistocene era. And so uh, you can see here cave bears and dire wolves and saber-toothed tigers and spotted lions, you know, all real-world stuff. So to answer your question, Paul, are they statted up in original D&D? 100% not. You get no statistics <laughs> whatsoever. No There's statistics. no explanation for this, right? It doesn't say Ice Age. It doesn't say you should put this in a campaign area. This is literally it, right? This right here um, is enough to key an entire campaign setting, but the DM in original D&D would have to make up every single stat for every single one of these things based on some general guidelines you get for animals in, in, in one line of text in original D&D. Mm -hmm. So here, no. First edition, yes, they start building out stats in advanced D&D. 
And I, I can't help but look at this table and want to um, use it next time I create my D&D character because I definitely want to play Saber T. Tiggs. <laughs> that's, that's my favorite. We, we were constrained for space. The di- Now, if you go back, go back two weeks. See, we plan this out, people. They, all of this stuff ties together. You go back two weeks, we were talking about how great the digest size books were. Admittedly, the one you know the one counter argument it's a little constrained for space, so sometimes the tables get squished. <laughs> oh, that's delightful. Somebody was really. How do we fit this in? How do we? I don't know. Start start abbreviating. Saber T takes. <laughs> they, they took. They took. They had to take one of the L's out of Wooly Rhinos. I will point out. <laughs> Hilarious. Hilarious. So that's fascinating. Yeah, um, <laughs> have, you, have you used this table, Dan? Ever use this one? I can't say. A, I will confess I haven't used it directly. Uh, I, I, I'm inspired by it this week. So I feel like, you know, it's a really easy call to say, I'm going to play a place in my campaign setting that has dinosaurs, right? A Lost World, huh. uh, King Kong Island kind of thing. But it's slightly more unusual to go, I'm going to put a place in my world that has late Pleistocene large mammals, um, and it's, I haven't done it to date, odd. but I feel like <laughs> it's exactly the curveball that I think that would get a good reaction. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I, I did know when I was in college, uh, uh, and my, my friend, friend in college and, uh, friend of the show, Adam, uh, used to like to run stuff in kind of frozen tundra settings. Um, and that's like the closest I, I think I've seen to this. Although I don't remember him using these kinds of monsters. I think it was just about more environmental hazards and like how, how inhospitable the area was to life of any kind, not, you know, and there are giant terrifying monsters that, that, that are capable of living in this environment. That's great. That's a good, that is a good, particularly, I know that Adam likes a lot of, uh, kind of horror based themed stuff. Um, so that is, that's actually a really great way to kind of <clears throat> conjure the alien, the, the cold alienness of the larger universe. Isn't there a recent 5e source book that was set in kind of a frozen wintry setting? A couple years ago, I think, right? Like, I think it's maybe two years ago. Um, yeah. uh, is it Rhyme of maybe, or... Ice Maiden? Rhyme of the Frostmaiden. Frostmaiden. Icewind Dell, Rhyme of the Frostmaiden. That's what I'm thinking of. There you go. Yeah, Yeah, I haven't looked at that. I wonder if it's got some... uh, I bet. I'm willing to bet no. I'm willing to bet probably no place to see era monsters in that book. But but please let me know if I'm wrong, uh, folks in the the chat. Now, speaking of 5th edition, I will point out that, um, you know, it is interesting if you look at uh, the advanced 1st edition monster manual, again, the, you know, generally speaking, the monster stats were much shorter, and you could put a lot more of them within a book. And Mm -hmm. so here, this table has eight distinct creatures. Um, If you look at 1st edition, actually, could you pull up the 1st edition table? Yeah, there Mm -hmm. you go. So this is what you get in the the advanced D&D dm's guide for the pleistocene conditions which is you know basically the same theme i cut off some of the the terrain types to fit on screen but you can see that um they you know as usual it it got expanded for advanced all of these creatures do actually have stats in the advanced dnd monster manual so the axe beak the balachotherium the cave bear giant boars etc etc mastodons mammoths spotted lions titanotheres these are all actually in the monster manual fully statted out at this point. Um, what is it, like about 20, 30? I can't say I ever thought of the Axe Beak as a um, frozen wasteland creature. I thought it was always presented as something that lived in, like, farmlands or something. And then, of course, you see them well, in the movie being plains. herded as a, as a, as a you know, kind of, you know, um, domesticated animal, which is bizarre. You can see that it's kind of mashed up, right? This is labeled Pleistocene. It's not labeled Ice Age. Um, so technically, Pleistocene had a couple Ice Ages in it, technically. 
Um, so you can see it's the, you've kind of, as usual, switching from original D&D that has a very clear theme to everything. Advanced D&D now becomes a little bit of a mixture of a couple different ideas, and you slightly lose what the theme was. Uh, but yeah, technically it was in the Pleistocene, so that's that's accurate presentation on this piece of paper. Okay. okay. Um, and and interestingly, gonna, yeah, out of this... So, uh, so, so the, the point that I want to make here is that yeah. And I and I I sorry sorry yeah. Paul um, uh, is out of these thirty or so animals uh, that have, are fully statted in first edition. If you look at the fifth edition monster manual, it only has three. Huh? Only three of these appear in the fifth edition monster manual. One of them is the axe beak. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Which I thought was surprising. <laughs> Can you guess the other two? Let me take a look. Um, mammoth? I'll put the mammoth in. Yeah. I don't think so. No. no. They have no. elephants. No. The edition has elephants in the core book. Now, one uh, of the. Uh, p- pick two that, that we've mentioned that would be obvious fantasy favorites. I would think the cave bear. I would think the cave bear would end up in there. And maybe that's saber tooth tiger. As a variant? As we know as a little, as, yeah, on our show. There you go. <laughs> they have, uh, you're correct, they have uh, saber tooth tigers, they have dire wolves, and they have a sidebar that says, oh, you could modify the polar bear and call it a cave bear if you want. Okay. And that's it. That's it. Yeah. So it's interesting how much they've, you know, reduced this uh, cornucopia that we had like in the first edition era. Similarly, just as a side note, like first edition had uh, details on, on almost 30 different dinosaurs, and in fifth edition, they just have six. Hmm. Hmm. Admittedly, I can't think of a lot of content that features these things, right? Like as we mentioned, even, even uh, G2, which seems like the ideal module to include some of these, doesn't have most of them. Mm-hmm. You know, you can see that uh, if you're playing D&D, you, you know, it's very easy to lean harder into the super fantasy elements, right? And you even see that in the 5th edition monster manual, for what it's worth, is that the main body of the book is all out-and-out out fantasy creatures, and the real-world creatures are pushed into an appendix at the end um, with kind of shorter stat blocks and stuff like that. So, you know, you can see you're playing, you're playing D&D, you you would have to perhaps um, make a little bit more effort as a DM to constrain yourself, which which is very interesting, frankly. Constrain yourself to kind of slightly less fantastical, more real world stuff to maybe get the biggest impact out of some of this stuff. Dan, I need I want I need to come back to the axe beak for a second here because I I need to know if I if I just like Google search for axe beak, all I come up with is D and D stuff. Was this an actual historical creature? This thing existed? Uh, it was. It was. Uh, oh. Okay, now we now we have a race for someone to come up with the correct real-world name for it. Right, um, right. Okay, so it's, that's not its actual name. That make that would explain why the Google search doesn't, doesn't give me what I want. <laughs> <laughs> All right, chat. See if you can beat Dan. What is the real-world <laughs> creature is, name? Yeah, I'm not actual- coming up with it, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay. okay. There you go. <laughs> challenge. Challenge to the chat. Uh, winner gets a chat cookie. challenge. So, um, <laughs> fascinating. Anyway, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll I'll leave the axe beak alone for for a minute here. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm trying to I'm trying to come up with an opinion here on like, is it bad that all these things got cut? Right? If they're not if they're underused, people aren't using them. Why waste the page space on them? You know, I get it. You know, it's a re- it's a completely reasonable argument, um, and it's it's really interesting that the axe beak was the breakout <laughs> was the breakout that got in the D and D movie. It was a really good is a really no, good point. That, um, that appearance in the D and D movie was so odd. <laughs> you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> Like a couple things. I kind of like the oddness, frankly. The oddness yeah. kind of worked for me, as a matter of fact. Okay, so here's so an interesting... Here's to, a, to give you one more mm-hmm. Axe thing, according to Google, the second most question asked about the Axe Beak is, can you ride an Axe Beak? Can you ride one? 
Yeah, what do you think? <laughs> I, I, with an ability check, I, I'm going to say yes. Yeah, yeah why not? Don't you roll for it. Yeah. People can ride uh, can ride the ostriches. Why not? Why not next week? Josh is guessing Titanus Wallary. Interesting. That sounds like a good guess to me. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll have so to what are the other uh, in the after chat. <laughs> <laughs> Please join join if you haven't already become a patron for a dollar. Join the after chat and join in our debate about what the historic what the prehistorical uh, real life uh, axe beak was. Excellent. <laughs> I can't even pronounce that one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, little side note. Who who had to look up how to pronounce Pleistocene five minutes before this show? <laughs> and has been mispronouncing it for over half a century, apparently, right up until this morning. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So the other thing um, I wanted to talk about is that, as a couple of folks know, um, I have uh, recently picked up uh, Jared Diamond's uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, which I probably should have read a long time ago. Um, it's a Pulitzer Prize winner from, I think, 1999, I believe, um, which you know tries to talk through the entire establishment of human society through agriculture and animals to you know what mm. the world looks like today. Um, so very, you know, very interesting work, and I'm, I'm sure there's a whole lot of things in here that could be debated by historians. But he largely predicates the book, and, and on the one hand, it's called Guns, Germs, and Steel, but really the foundation of it is really about agriculture and domesticated animals. Like at least half the book is really about that as the root of where technology and society comes from. So, so hmm. he points out, and it, I guess it's really so, pretty solidly established at this point, and something that I didn't know until just the last couple of weeks is that, um, you know, the domesticated animals that we have in the world today, the large domesticated animals, like over 100 pounds, um, there's only 13, right? There's only 13 large domesticated animals in the entire history of humanity that have been successfully controlled and domesticated. Twelve hmm. of those domesticated animals are come from Eurasia, right? Only one comes from South America, namely the llama. None in North America, none in Africa, none in Australia. Hmm. And so there's this really fascinating question of like, why were the, the number of large domesticated animals you could use for meat, you could use for transportation, so overwhelmingly lopsided in Eurasia? And the uh, geological evidence is that Initially, all the different continents all had large, large mammals. Uh, North America had giant sloths and saber-toothed tigers and woolly rhinos and all kinds of large things. And more or less, when around when the last ice age ended, about ten thousand years ago, and humans were able to expand to the other continents, all the large animals went extinct at about that time. Um, and there's a little bit of debate about why that's so perfectly synchronized, but it's really fascinating that the, the animals that seem to have evolved with us in Africa and Eurasia were able to defend themselves, and all the other large animals on all the other continents went extinct shortly after humans showed up which is a, a, a startling, a startling thing to realize. But my point with that is that compared to, di obviously dinosaurs never existed in the world at the same time as human beings. But all of these animals we're talking about here did. At, you know, anatomically modern human beings actually interacted with all of these ice age type animals. Mammoths and, you know, whatever we're calling axe beaks and um, you know, mastodons and saber-toothed tigers and cave bears, um, we have evidence that people actually did interact with them. So in some sense, these animals are things that are sort of baked into our evolution in the world. In some sense, humans are 
familiar with these things, right? And it's weird because pop culture grabs more onto dinosaurs, which humans never actually interacted with, when there are these things. And again, my point here is if you pull these things in your game, there's this uncanny valley effect of you kind of, they sort of kind of feel like things in the world, even though most people don't know them through pop culture. Um, so I feel in some sense they're more, uh, they're, they're better subjects for characters to interact with or to have for like animal companions mm. or to have for familiars for your druid or ranger characters. I think they're really, really great options and pets than like dinosaurs or something like that. Um, so interesting, interesting to think about that they are things that humans actually really didn't interact with. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be a, a very interesting game to play, honestly, of a game that's set in the Ice Age, and maybe you're in a very, mm -hmm. very primitive, you know, setting at that point, right? Not not quite the classic medieval setting we think of as for D&D, &D, but still one with, that could have fighting men and wizards and, right, uh, such. And then just the world is just populated with these horrific giant mammals. That's, that's crazy. I think it's a great idea, Paul. And on that theme, what a what a great thought that is. So I pulled out a an old issue of Dragon Magazine uh, that I had here. That's one of my favorites, actually. So this is Dragon number sixty eight. You can see it's a dragon spewing some frost over an icy terrain, right? Uh, from uh, nineteen eighty two, December nineteen eighty two. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole art, the whole issue is basically you know weather themed. And coincidentally, because I've, I've pulled this up in the past, this is the same issue that had the weather in the world of Greyhawk system that established a really complicated, <laughs> really very complicated <laughs> weather system that was technically, you know, was, was marked as the official weather system for Gary Gygax's Greyhawk and was included in the box set later on. Um, and in this same issue, you also have an article <clears throat> by Arthur Collins, no relation, called Thrills and Chills, Ice Age Adventures. Nice. Great piece of art here, along with that. That's, that's <laughs> exactly what you're talking about. So if you were going to run an adventure like Paul was talking about, which is a really interesting idea, you should look up, you should look up this dragon number 68 uh, and, and get some ideas from Arthur Collins. And he goes through uh, modifying the different um, the different races uh, to be like there's caveman versions of um, dwarves and halflings and elves, uh, cut down weapons list, kind of extensive encounter tables, and weirdly, an entirely separate weather system. <laughs> When there's another <laughs> weather system in the same issue, and you get another two pages about like weather and temperature and seasonal adjustments and wind chill, right? Which is when there's another system in the same issue, right? There's here's this one's when th I think there's a wind chills chart twice in this issue in two separate <laughs> articles, <laughs> right? Can you believe that? Um, so, uh, so I was, was like, the writers were maybe like, not right. coordinating efforts very well. That's interesting. They were not, they were That's... not, they got it and they, they slammed it in one issue here. Uh, now one thing I will say, and, and I, I, I haven't to, to, you can use this for some inspirations, <laughs> but, the, uh, and I, and I also say that he, that, uh, Arthur here was inspired by reading Clan of the Cave Bear, which is where this comes. He was, oh, I'd recently read Clan of the Cave Bear and I just had to make a campaign setting like that. And again, I love pulling stuff from outside D&D, right? It's not merely just talking about D&D, it's talking about other stuff, which I think is fantastic. But the main, the main thrust here is what did people do, you know, shortly at, you know, in the Ice Age, at the, at, in the late Pleistocene? Well, they just gathered food. That, that, they just, that's, all, that's all you could do. You were, just, you were just struggling for survival. Just can you eat enough on a regular day? So a, a rather large, the main thrust of the article is how do you get enough food for your clan? You got to gather vegetables and you got to hunt. And you're going to need two bushels of vegetables per month per person. And you're going to need one hit die of animals per person per month. So you better be out hunting the place to see animals to get enough food to keep your clan together. And, uh, you know, my, my thought process nowadays is 
And that's why you don't have any large mammals. Because <laughs> that's actually what happened. Yeah, they, they got they got hunted out. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Cool article, though. Yeah, yeah, that's very nice. I can't I can't help though but think that that feels like maybe kind of a a, a bit of a a boring plot hook for your D and D campaign of just go get food. The end. I yeah. <laughs> I think I, I think I want a little more, a little more of, of uh, some kind of plot of something interesting. Going on. I agree. I will, I will confess I never used that. I never tried that because even even in my own OCD state, I was like, eh, I don't know how that how long term that's going to be. You know, hypothetically, you could consider it as a war game, right? You could consider it kind of like uh, a little bit like a barbarian prince board game a little bit, if you look at it maybe in that in that zone. But I, I, I got to admit, I wouldn't run literally a campaign that was like, can you get enough hit dice of food per month? Yeah. I mean, you could certainly, I could see starting there, right? That's maybe an interesting right. starting yeah. point. And maybe you play a little bit of that. But I feel right. like you've got to add some layers, especially since like we're playing D&D. So now there's going to be, you know, magic, right? So magic is going to exist. Let's, let's right. have... I don't know, something. Right. And Collins has some interesting, you know, modifications for it and how you'd have to do that and modifications to your your pantheon, right, would have to would presumably be much simpler. Um, so it, it's you got some interesting nuggets of ideas there that you could use to build that out and then make things weird. Hmm. And be start out. Start out like that and then make things weird. That's not bad. Hmm. Interesting. Um. Hmm. So I, I, on that I, point, I, go ahead. Sorry, I, I I was just just continuing to think of like what it would be like to run an ice age campaign. You mentioned that there's alternate equipment lists. I think I would also want to see a treatment on like, well, what are settlements like? What kind of you know what kind of buildings or you know are there tombs right are there how do, how are the dead being prepared in this time period what kind of houses are people living in you know in, what uh you know what what kind of dungeons can i have do they exist is they just natural caves right probably that's what i would think well for me know. you know one one thing i could say is um and at least in the collins article he takes all the classic D D races and makes them caveman versions uh, but I could say, you know, what if there are, you know, other races that are much longer lived, that have a longer history? So maybe there are elves or dwarves that have actually had technological societies while humans are still in their in their caveman state, right? And that would provide dungeons, mm -hmm. that would be, provide structures, almost a little like Gamma Worldy, right? Almost a little yeah. like we don't even understand what this, what a building is or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Hmm. You'd need players to play along with, you know, with we don't we don't know what the you know we don't know what a what a pole arm is today. <laughs> like what's a I horse? Mean, some, you know, there's some classic tropes there of like I've certainly seen plenty of D and D adventures of like we are exploring the you know tomb or remains of a lost civilization, right? So I could certainly that actually would probably be quite fun, right? Of like, yeah, okay, so right. you do come across something that looks like a more modern dungeon but like this is just unheard of in your you know society like what is this you know who who could have created these perfectly square tunnels and how right, right? why are all these dead bodies in here etc there's a, there's an illustration in this in this kids book kids book from the 1970s I'll, I'll remind you uh there's you know there's a four page article here on cave bears right and so there is a there is an illustration here of you know primitive humans uh hunting a ca hunting a cave bear in its cave and it's it's a it's a bloody mess it's a terrifying bloody <laughs> mess for no. a kids book uh in in the mid seven in you know the mid 70s there so there's that and then the next page has and, and the reason this article got written is you have archaeological evidence that this actually happened. And then at the end of the scenario, you get a, you get an illustration of uh, the humans burying 
multiple heads of cave bears in a tiny little mound that's a tomb. So my 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 understanding is that at the time that's as much architecture as you got. Yeah, that's 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 your dungeon right there. Is one one room of just heads. Yeah. Hmm. hmm. Interesting. Unless you pull some some other fantasy element in. So, so uh, yeah, the, which is I feel like the direction I would want to go. Some strange, unheard yeah. of, you know, race that's that's long gone. Maybe already gone or whatever. Maybe this is you know maybe that's what happens to the elves. The elves retreated from this land because it freaking froze, and they were like, "It's too damn cold. We can't live here." Yeah. Or vice versa. Maybe they're ice elves, and as the ice age begins to end, they're treating with the uh, with the ice sheets. Mm. Leaving behind their stuff. Hmm. Hmm. Is it would be a possibility. I have a I, I have a convers- Yeah. If, let me let me say one other thing if I can. The, I had a conversation online where someone was trying to come up with an alternate um, civil war story, and what kinds of like may could could you have used prehistoric creatures uh, for beasts of burden, like in the Civil War time, other than horses. And it, wh- while I'm reading the Diamond Book, I'm thinking, you know, it, it really wouldn't have taken that much of a different twist of history to still have the large megafauna that was native to North America around, saber-toothed tigers or mammoths or uh, uh, um, giant sloths or Balachotherium, which, which again is in advanced D&D, which is the, 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 a giant, you know, twice as tall as an elephant land creature. Thank you. Right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, just an enormous, just a no- ridiculously enormous creature. There's, I think it's the last thing in uh, my book here. I just love this illustration. I've got to yeah. pull it up here. Yeah, um, I very much appreciate so, the inclusion here of a, of a little... Um, right. You know, of a, human silhouette there just to give you a sense of how big this thing is. Well done. And I love this illustration by Rod Ruth with with the birds, right? A flock of birds flying around its knees. (laughs) (laughs) I've always I've always adored the scaling (laughs) of um, of this illustration right here. So I feel, you know, if you know somehow people and animals had interacted slightly differently in about ten thousand years ago you know, maybe we actually could have had these things. Maybe we actually could have had tame Balachotherium like people use elephants today. And maybe, mm. you know, a slightly different twist in how history had gone. You might have actually had those things domesticated or at least be in use in modern times. And, you know, maybe the Civil War or something like that. So I feel like the in in the broader multiverse, the, the shard in which we have these things in possibly medieval times or classical times or even now is very close, relatively mm-hmm. speaking. And so I think that the, the, um, the, the Ice Age creatures are really a great opportunity to grab something that's a little bit uncanny, that people know less well than dinosaurs, and yet humans really did actually interact with them. And you can have all kinds of interesting ways. Like I continually want a campaign setting in which Balachotherium are your standard transportation animal, right? And you can carry <laughs> practically a whole village worth of stuff from place to place on tamed, you know, 50 foot tall Balachotheriums, I think would be a really great, interesting, it would look fantastical, and yet it mm-hmm. kind of sort of isn't. And I think that's a great opportunity to um, put some interesting flavor and maybe make people learn about the world even when they don't realize that's what's happening. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Are you aware, Dan, of any existing content? I mean, we talked a little bit about G2. Um, are you aware of any existing scenarios? Any, any, like, I mean, it's, it's interesting to see articles like you showed in Dragon Magazine of, of how to adapt to an Ice Age. But are there print material of Ice Age content? I, you know, I, I would draw a blank on that. Not uh, traditionally from, not classically from the makers of D&D. Uh, and we all know you have more than one uh, dinosaur-themed island 
Um, you have the you know Isle of Dread, of course, uh, for the expert set that's basically all dinosaurs. And you have Gary's Isle of the Ape that more or less recreates King Kong's Island for advanced D&D. Um, and you can point to a whole lot of other examples as well. But yeah, the uh, the place to sown the place to see you know huge mammals. I'm not aware of any campaign setting that digs into that to that degree. Maybe somebody else knows in the chat. I mean, the the other thought that's coming to me is rather than um, rather than doing uh, what we've been discussing here of having the players play some you know prehistoric versions of of men and men and dwarves and elves um, is to play with time travel, right? Like. Let's, let's oh, yeah. take a modern D&D party and accidentally shunt them back in time a bunch for some reason. I'm sure there's some plotty reason why you have to go back to then. And then have you have your, you know, kind of mo n more modern D&D party exploring a world that is populated with these creatures. Uh, and what, what makes that interesting to me, I think, is that is that it lets you play a little bit more with the players kind of really uh, immersing themselves in the sensation of, yeah, this is unusual. This is strange, right? I, as much as you say, like, you would love to see this world where there's, where there's transport using, I can't even remember how to pronounce this creature's name out loud. It's 50 feet tall, rhinoceros. <laughs> I might um, not, I might not, I might not be saying it pro properly either when I say yeah. the Latchetherium. <laughs> the Latchetherium. Um, you know, but you could have that just appear just as, like you could have that in the world, but still have the players reacting to it as, as in this like wide-eyed wonder, what the yeah. hell is this thing, right? Yeah, I think it's, it's nice. Yeah, agreed. I like and I think if a, if a campaign like that was a little bit extensive, right, you'd wind up in a situation where they can't replace their gear, right? Yeah. Uh, Gary did that with Isle of the Eight pretty hard, is you could have degrading gear and their magic runs out of charges in classic D&D. And there's no clear way how to recover it. And if their equipment mm -hmm. breaks or something like that, you know, they run out of arrows. Unclear exactly how to get more, maybe. Um, so that yep. would become an interesting traditional kind of war gamey resource management challenge. I should put up that our, our viewers are coming up with some, some um, thoughts about uh, prior published stuff. Kevin Thompson is saying <laughs> that there was a setting called Blood and Snow by ICRPG. And Edwin Sue is reminding us that um, uh, the 3.5 edition had a resource book called Frostburn. That's right. I remember that. Hmm. That's, that's, uh, that's interesting. Who's, I have to look this up. <laughs> use a Brontotherium. Use a, <laughs> use a Thunder Beast in your game, right? Another another creature in the rhino family, twice as big as a modern rhinoceros. Hmm. Again, you can see from as it runs by this this pack of herd animals here. Use a brontotherium. Nobody nobody <laughs> expects that. That's great. <laughs> I think I feel like Dan, the, the the one of the difficulties you'll face in this kind of content if you're running this kind of campaign is what is the you know motivation for actually encountering these creatures. I, I guess it makes sense if you're pushing on the like you just need food. You got better get out there and hunt because yeah. you need food. Because otherwise, it strikes me that like yeah, you could encounter these creatures, and generally the creatures probably either don't care about you or would rather not be bothered. Right, and so I would I would worry that the D and D campaign would be calm. Oh, that's an interesting thing. Let's move away. <laughs> well, okay. Well, you know, and and you know, D again, Diamond's point is that, and and you're you're hitting on a really true uh, uh, vein there. Is that Diamond's point is that probably you know among the problems is that uh, you know in prehistory is that animals that evolved on a continent with without humans didn't realize what a completely mortal threat humans are and and had no way to defend themselves right and probably and you know probably like a giant sloth was like you know would just stand there while hunters came up and you know took took care of it um so it, it actually it actually is a a real problem that the all the, many of these animals we're talking about would possibly arguably be too tame <laughs> would be too tame around humans so yeah, maybe yeah. Okay, maybe like maybe with a time travel thing, maybe the best thing you can do is go capture them. Like maybe 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 your goal is like, we need to go capture these things, bring them back because they're so easily tameable 
and we can use them as beasts of burden, right? They're wonderful. They're actually better than a lot of other animals in this way. So we need to go to the exotic location and bring them back. And that's difficult because they're really big and we don't, our ships won't fit. Our ships won't fit them. What are you going to do about that? So maybe instead of, maybe, maybe the campaign becomes not so much about killing them, right? But about making friends with them and bring it. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> really, the point, the friends with the megafauna that we made along the way, Paul? <laughs> that's that's hilarious. I, I feel like I would much more want to lean in the direction of where you were you were positing, like, what if these monsters, monsters, what if these, these creatures, these megafauna did get domesticated, right? So now maybe your characters in the D&D world have traveled back in time and you have to deal with a society that has domesticated these things. Maybe it's not even back in time. Maybe it's an alternate universe or a lost land kind of thing or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. You go into a new space and be like, oh my gosh, there's these, they have these domesticated creatures that are just out of, out of our understanding. Especially if they're using them not just for like transport and beast of burden, but maybe they are actually using them aggressively in a, in a warlike way. Right, right, right. right. I'm, I'm, right. You know, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to my war game table with my, my heavy cavalry, which I love so much. And the other side shows up with armored Balachitherium. I'm like, oh, oh no, <laughs> oh, oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh no, <laughs> I didn't see that coming. <laughs> well, Dan, we are about out of time here. Um, do you have any final thoughts on Ice Age uh, monsters? At the moment, I feel very inspired to use them because I really feel that they fit this. As I've said a couple of times, they really fit this uncanny valley of something real that people don't know about. Something that human beings actually did interact with and actually had major impacts on our mutual evolution, right? So there's something that exists in a world you know, that, that humans exist in the same world, have a lot of ways that we can interact with them to tame them or hunt them or be hunted by them with, you know, the carnivores like a saber-toothed tiger or something like that. And I think having a lost world, maybe time travel or something like that, you can go to and bring back would actually you know, feel in some ways better than the classic dinosaur type stuff. And on the one hand, be real, but be more surprising to the players in some ways. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for gaming like that. And, um, you know, if our, if our thoughts are, uh, I'm currently right now living in a snowy wilderness, <laughs> <laughs> then you can it's a it's a great opportunity in the winter to tie that into your gaming so i think there's a lot a lot of possibilities there i mean i think that's that's a very interesting point right and we've talked about this i'm sure in the past around weather but that like one of the hardest things about weather effects to model is not when they are actively you know encumbering you like like when you slip on ice or whatnot but when it's just an annoyance right you're like, yeah, it's cold. Your your characters yeah. are shivering, and you know, or it's raining, yeah. and that makes your characters unhappy. Like, then you're just leaning on the player's ability to pretend that their characters are unhappy. Whereas, yes, if they did just walk in and shake the snow off their coats and all oh, pull off their snow boots and sit down at the table, and you can immediately roll into like, and you're back out in the snow, right? And maybe it's a little easier for them to immerse themselves. Uh, I have a proposition <laughs> for you, Dan, which is maybe the next time we do a design dash, perhaps we should do it at, in a, in this setting. What do you think? Oh, that's great. Oh, yes. Yes, please, Paul. Let's do that. All right. Great. Mark that down. Yeah. Future episode, we will do a, a Pleistocene design dash. Uh, viewers, great. if you have any thoughts, uh, other Pleistocene creatures that you would like to see featured in our design dash or... Uh, how we might uh, warp content to include creatures from this this period, uh, leave us a comment here in the YouTube video. We'd love to hear from you and maybe incorporate that in our future episodes. Yeah, definitely. And of course, remember that you can like, follow, and subscribe to us. We're on YouTube and Twitch and Facebook and GitHub and TikTok, and we have a handle wandering DMs on all of those sites, so please look for us there. If you prefer to listen to this show in audio-only podcast format, you can find those podcasts on our website at wanderingdms.com or through various podcast carriers such as iTunes and Spotify and Pocket Cast and all your favorites. If you are listening to the show right now on a third-party podcast carrier and they offer the ability to do so, please rate and review our show. That helps other users of that site find us, and we really appreciate it. 
Yeah, we really do. And of course, big thanks to our patrons who support the show here. If you'd like to join them, please visit patreon.com slash wanderingdms. And just like Paul said at the top of the show, we'll be there in about 10 minutes on our Discord server that you get access to for our video after chat every Sunday. And of course, the conversation continues 24-7 all the time. Um, so uh, yeah, so we'll think about uh, other upcoming shows uh, coming up in the future that we're going to talk about later on. And um, of course, we're both there today in the after chat. Am I right, Paul? Yep, I'll be there. Subject to my connection working, if it doesn't get frozen out or something crazy like that, we'll both <laughs> be there in about 10 minutes. So hope you'll be there too. And of course, don't forget, we are live every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So please join us again next week for another thought-provoking discussion. We'll see you then. <laughs>